Hello, this is FX Radio and I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. And with me on the line today is Sarah Franklin, who is a registered nurse and a naturopath and who has a specialty in caring for cancer patients. So welcome, Sarah. Thanks, Andrew. (laughs) So, Sarah, tell me about your history because you're an RN and a naturopath. What sparked the interest or the change when you were a registered nurse? Um, well, when I finished my nursing degree, I, I did. I specialised in oncology and worked in oncology in it. And then at at that stage of my life, we were looking at having children. So a part of the, I guess, the recommendation for oncology nurses is that we step out of the day unit 12 months before getting pregnant because of the, the known mutagenic effects on the fetuses. Yep. So I went back to palliative care, um, which is what I majored in with my nursing degree. Um And when I was doing the palliative nursing, I felt that I just wasn't getting enough mentally because the oncology in it was quite highly, a lot of grey matter stuff going on. Mm -hmm. Um, So when I went back to palliative care, I got a little bit, I just felt like I needed to learn more. So I didn't have a particular interest in natural medicine, but I liked plants. So I started studying botany. And then through learning about plants, I was like, oh, the penny dropped that. Um, so many constituents in plants was what our medications and what our chemotherapy was made out of. So that led me to more research on plants and medications and pharmacology. And from there, it sort of stepped into naturopathy. So it's sort of something that evolved from... Um, I, I, when, I, when I was working as an oncology nurse, I had no idea what natural therapy was. So it's been a real evolution of information and opening your mind and looking at different ideas and concepts and and realising that there's more than one ways to treat cancer patients. And so tell me how you rationalised your medically trained mind with naturopathic principles that aren't so, you know, dare I say the word black box, they're not so diagnostic. Um, I think I rationalised it through, I think having worked in the the medical world, I think you realise that it's not black and white, that there's still a lot of grey in medicine. So I think with the two, it's realising what... I guess that reality of what I can treat and what I can't treat and being realistic about um, what treatment outcomes I expect from patient care. Mm -hmm. Um, So I guess it's really really easy to rationalise the two because um, although the medical system seems to focus more on disease, specific disease management rather than the system, um, where naturopathy works more on the system rather than the specific disease, they still... Um, they still support each other. So I think I, definitely the, naturopo- the naturopathic concept to me makes more sense to look at the whole system rather than just a specific part. But I think having having background in both, I realise that you just get exposed that it's a lot more grey in both areas. So don't try and treat a patient with a black and white option, but you have it's just a whole world of grey. So you've just really got to treat cancer by cancer and patient by patient. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you there. I think naturopathic medicine has um, gotten caught up a little bit in trying to be little doctors, and I think we're losing something of the beauty of naturopathic medicine in in its generality. I think it's that's part of its power. Um, oh, I, I totally agree, Andrew. And I think the more uh, you're definitely seeing more naturopathic information trying to become like doctors becoming disease specific but that's where the biggest weakness in medicine is is trying to be disease specific rather than a general body system so do you still nurse as uh sorry in a hospital setting yeah i still yeah i still do nursing to keep my registration so i still do do shifts in oncology but not day units now i just work in the oncology ward um so we've certainly got chemotherapy running on the wards but it's not as intense as a day unit um, and still doing palliative care, so I'm still doing a lot of end-stage cancer um, cancer patients. Um, but I also work in emergency um, as well, which just helps with more of my clinical skills and just general, um, you know, general general medical knowledge, I guess, because you see so many different um, patterns of disease coming through the door in emergency that um, it's sort of good to, to maintain all your nursing skills. So, Sarah, when you're working at the hospital... 
Um, do your staff around you and the doctors know that you're that you do naturopathic support for cancer patients as well? Um, it's certainly something I, I guess I don't advertise when I'm when I'm working on the ward as an oncology nurse. I'm there or as a registered nurse. I'm working as a registered nurse, so mm-hmm. I'm respectful of the employer. So mm-hmm. that's why I'm there. Yeah. So I certainly don't give naturopathic advice. Um, if patient, if if other colleagues ask what do I do, then I definitely tell them. Mm-hmm. Um, I, having worked in my industry, all um, most of the oncologists on the coast here know who I am, um, and a lot of them I've worked with as a registered nurse on a on a peer to peer basis, um, and certainly of the the day units, I know most of the the managers that run their units on the Gold Coast, the oncology units, having worked in that industry. So I certainly find that definitely nurses seem to be a lot more accepting and open to the naturopathic treatment of oncology patients. Mm -hmm. Um, And there are certainly some doctors that are okay with it, but of course there are some doctors who struggle with the concepts that we have. And and so... Tell me, look, why do you think the nurses are more accepting of naturopathic medicine? Is it because of what they see in their patients, what you know, their struggles that their patients have? I, I think so. I think so. I think it. I think that, and you know, coming from a nursing base myself and a palliative base, that the one thing that really stuck in my mind as an oncology nurse and palliative nurse is that when you're nursing people when they are dying from cancer, you see all the water could have, should have. Mm. So, I, you know, I've, I've certainly nursed plenty of patients who have died from using chemotherapy and radiation and no natural therapies, mm. and they've lied there in a hospital bed thinking, what if I'd done something different? What mm. if I changed my diet? What if I'd done some natural things? But on the other hand, I've certainly nursed patients who have done everything naturally and they're dying from cancer, and they've said, what if I'd had some surgery? What if I'd had some chemotherapy? Yes. What if I'd had some radiation? So... I certainly, I guess the one thing that's really stuck with me is, from my experience, is that um, you've really got to throw everything you can at it, but you also, your patient has to have that peace of mind to know that they're comfortable with the decisions they make because at the end of the day, it's the patient that will live live with the consequences of those decisions that they've made, not the practitioner. So I think definitely on a palliative, um, I guess on a palliative basis, Nurses, we spend a lot more time with the patients when they're dying and grieving and you're working through the process with the family where the doctors don't have as much contact with the patient in the palliative stages. But I think also the struggle with the oncologist is that a lot of them don't understand how the herbs and medicines work. Mm. So they're very black and white, so they don't like interference with their treatment protocol because they don't know what might have caused, you know, the white blood cells to go down or to go up or the liver function to go down or up. So... I guess they don't like variables and with patients that use natural therapy, you're going to have variables that they're not used to. I think now we're uh, we're at least opening that door um, to the stage where we can see the effects of some natural medicines in, in tandem with chemotherapeutic agents and, and we're seeing that it supports, you know, neutropenia and things like that. Um, but it's a whole... It's a whole new area of research that needs to be explored, isn't it? So I've got to say, Sarah, I wholeheartedly support what you said regarding if the patient was lying there going, would have, should have, could have. What would I have done, could have, I have done. And that goes with both um, orthodox medicine and natural medicine. And I, I do like the, um, the way that Olivia Newton-John explained it when she was going through this in her mind. You know, what should I do? Um, should I go Eastern, which she termed as the encompassing term for alternative medicine, or Western, the orthodox medicine? And um, she said, well, why can't I do both? Now, again, I wholeheartedly support you that it is the patient's choice because they are the ones that are going to live or die with those consequences. So I think that's beautifully, beautifully said by you. Well done. Yeah, and I think also coming from a naturopathic base, I know that when patients get very sick and they're in their terminal stages, they don't come back to the practitioner, the naturopathic practitioner. So often the naturopath doesn't know what happened to that patient. Did they go see somebody else or yeah. what happened? So a lot of naturopaths don't see what happens at that end stage too to know, I guess to take accountability and responsibility for the advice that you give because um, I think I think when you do see what happens at the end, you're a lot more... 
um, realistic about your accountability for the advice that you give to patients. So tell me about then your treating principles with natural and orthodox medicine, like, you know, for instance, supporting or not curing, that sort of thing. Yeah, so I guess um, I, I definitely would probably fit in the box of being a complementary therapist rather than alternate. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that, you know, I've seen time and time again how natural medicine is so supportive for patients with chemotherapy. So I've certainly seen, you know, the liver coat better, the survival rates are better, their recovery from chemotherapy is better, immune systems better. So there's so many benefits that can be provided to patients, cancer patients with nutritional support. Um, it's just being very aware of how your treatments work and you not consciously need to be aware of how they might interfere or um, are they going to have any impact on their treatment on the other side as well. So there's no point a patient having chemotherapy if what you're doing is going to to not make the chemotherapy work so well. So they both have to, to really support each other. Um, but I guess my principle would be when a patient, if, they, if they're deciding to go through chemo radiation, to do everything I can to support their immune system, their liver, so that when they're finished treatment, they're in the best position. So then that I guess that's where I feel like our work really begins, is after treatment, really rebuilding and preventing the reoccurrence of disease. Right. So, so what main herbs, nutrients, foods, and of course lifestyle changes do you institute in practice? Um, I guess obviously the, the the major ones would be you know reducing the sugar, um, the acid alkaline sort of diets. So, but I'm also realistic that if the patients lose too much weight during treatment, what ends up happening on the other end is that their chemotherapy protocols get changed or reduced or stopped because. If the patient's losing a lot of weight, the oncologist will think it's the chemotherapy, not the diet that they're on. So practitioners certainly need to be careful that they're not losing too much weight during mm. treatment because it will affect their um, what options that they're provided by the oncologist. Mm, absolutely. So, but definitely low sugar, lots of green foods. I guess I'm not anal with diets because I'm realistic of how sick they are during treatment. So you've got to not put the fear of God in with the diet because at the end of the day, there's going to be some days that they're not going to want to eat. So they just need to eat. So you've got to be realistic about um, at what parts you're going to be strict with their diet and what parts you just need to be realistic that yeah. they're really struggling. And if they want a piece of toast with veggie mite for a couple of days, it's not the end of the world. Mm-hmm. But um, but definitely acid alkaline diet, I find very effective. The low sugar, getting rid of all the processed meats and processed foods that are very highly acidic out of the diet, um, making sure that their calorie counts sufficient, making sure they've got plenty of fats and protein in the diet as well, um, but also making sure that there are enough carbohydrates, So, but just from a lower GI source, so trying to go with just healthier options for the carbohydrates. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess as far as supplements go, um, I love all the angiogenic stuff, so I love St. Mary's Sissel, turmeric, resveratrol, um, all those sort of all those sort of things. Um, I use a lot of modified citrus pectin, pawpaw, uh, bovine, um, oh, you know, some really nice herbs like cat's claw and those sort of herbs that are very good for cancer patients and good at rebuilding the immune system up. So they're probably some of the most like a lot of the supplements that I do use um, with cancer patients. But I guess um, I guess a common thing that I see is patients seem to think that you treat cancer the same way every time, but every cancer you treat differently because yeah. they all have a different mechanism of action. They've all got different things that promote that disease. But also, as well as treating cancer differently, you need to treat the patient differently. So they yeah. might have complications within their disease management that you have to work around as far as surgery or blood thinners or other things that can happen during treatment as well. Yep. So do you find that that, that your treatment varies um, you know, dramatically with each type of cancer and also between the different patients with similar cancers? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think any, any practitioner that thinks that they can come up with a magic formula to treat everybody with just won't work. And even I can treat two patients with identical disease the same way and I'll get a different response. Mm. So it's, you know, I think if there was something surefire bullet, we would all know about it. Mm. But we do know that there's certain groups of herbs and supplements that are are very, very beneficial. So um, it's trying to cover as many bases as you can as far as, you know, cover liver support, cover the immune system, cover, um, you know, angiogenic 
um, things that might work in an angiogenic way. Mm. So, but you definitely, there's not a patient that comes in here that gets treated the same way because they're all so, so different. Mm. They're a patient, they're a person. Yep. Um, and I think one of the the hallmarks there is that, you know, we're, we're now learning that when somebody has our cancer, they actually have our cancers, that, you know, the, the, the whole point of cancer is that it's forgotten that it's a normal cell. So it becomes this, um, you know, tends to be a non-differentiated, um, you know, dumb cell that's forgotten to stop growing and then multiplies ad hoc. Um, and so we can see different um, drivers, even in a cancer that might be, let's say, in an estrogenic um, sensitive tissue, we might see a, a non-estrogenic cancer. Yeah, exactly. And if only the immune system could pick up on and identify cancer cells, then we'd be in a totally different ballgame. Mm. And, and so but, um, just on that, at that point about the immune system, because it's a real issue, you know, with a lot of chemotherapeutic agents where they get neutropenic, but... Um, also, the issue with um, tumour-associated macrophages being a direct prognostic indicator, um, if you've got high TAMs, for instance, say in breast cancer, then you've got a, um, a low prognosis. What sort of work's being done that? Like, do you see that often? Do you see the measuring TAMs in hospital situations now? Very No, I'd say very rarely. I'd say it's, it's still something that's coming mm. and we're learning a lot more about it. But um, even just... Um, Profiles to measure natural killer cell um, levels is rarely done. Really, so the, I, I would say majority no. I'd say that there's not there's not enough um, from a medical perspective. There's not enough investigation as to how the actual immune system is functioning um, because at the end of the day, the immune system was obviously compromised in the first place of the cancer to take hold initially. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then the chemotherapy. Um, obviously suppresses the immune system, not through that it's a benefit of chemotherapy, but as a side effect of treatment. So do you do you see, though, on the ward when, let's say, you know, they're on a one of the platinum drugs, that they tend to measure white cell count more regularly? Or, the, you know, the cyclophosphamide, do, you, do they tend to measure them more regularly than if they're on a different chemotherapeutic regime? Uh, no, I, no, I would say no. I would say that um, definitely kidney functions and things get checked more with your with your you know more your, more of those sort of drugs. Yeah. Um, but no, immune system pretty much the standard protocol is that they'll do the blood test, um, and then they'll do a blood test before that next round of chemo. But very rarely do patients have testing in between cycles. So as long as their immune system is sufficient to have that next round of care, chemotherapy and they'll usually have that round of chemotherapy. So not unless it was indicated that, you know, there was a reason to monitor it, I'd say that no, the only monitoring that occurs is per cycle, um, just before each cycle occurs. Yeah. And you made an interesting point there, you know, just about measuring kidney function, because it's a major issue that um, rather than just saying a broad effect on the immune system, that chemotherapeutic agents, depending on which one they are, um, tend to have um, a toxic effect on an organ. Like, for instance, you get cardiotoxicity with some, nephrotoxicity with others, autotoxicity, you know, uh, you know, your liver gets compromised and, and, and other tissues as well. So do you tend to also vary what you supplement or what you give people depending on their regime? In absolutely. regards to protecting yeah, against toxicity? So I'll have a look at what the... What are the, what are the um what are the side effects treatment? So yeah, is it, is, does it more affect the nervous system more or kidneys or liver? And then I'll base my treatment around what, what the side effects are going to be. So if I, knew, if I know peripheral neuropathy is going to be a, an, an issue, then I'll definitely be making sure that we've got bees in there supporting the immune system. Bacopa is a really good herb to help with the nervous system too. Mm -hmm. So you'll definitely start launching into supporting what you can because you know what, and again, you'll know the long-term ramifications of how patients struggle with neuropathy years after treatment. So you'll definitely move it depending on the type of drugs that they're using, but I also, my treatment might vary depending on the excretion time of the drug. So some drugs are excreted quite quickly within a within a three-day period where there's some drugs that are, are longer where um, it's still traceable in the faeces and your uh, faeces um, for up to seven to ten days. Right. Okay, so uh, the other question in my mind is that you get your initial presentation of cancer or the patient presents with initial cancers. They have their 
um, their treatment and supportive therapy and off they go. And then they have, as measured by medicine, a five-year survival rate or 10-year in some breast cancers, mostly five-year. And then around that five-year mark, you know, you've always got to be vigilant after the fact, but that's where you've got to be hypervigilant about recurrence. How much of your practice is devoted to people who have got secondary cancers, Sarah? Um, I'd say I see as many secondaries as I do primary. Um, but I, in saying that with that five-year remission question, I think what happens is a tendency for people to... They'll come and see naturopaths to support them through the chemotherapy and afterwards, but often after that 12-month mark, they seem to drop off and forget about their disease to a degree and they become complacent yep. and then um, and then you'll definitely see them back with metastatic disease. So it's definitely a common phenomenon for them to become complacent. Um, but you've also got to be realistic as a practitioner that these guys have gone through a very emotional and a very physical, um, physically traumatic period of time and they get to a point where they just want to be left alone. So they've been poked and prodded by everyone and they've taken supplements and they've taken this and they've taken that and they just get to a point where most of them will throw their hands up and go, I don't want to take it anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of just supporting them and saying, that's fine, that's normal, and how about we give you a break for a bit and then restart again. So an another point that I've seen with a couple of patients of mine is they've had a great response with their initial cancer. One of them particularly has come back with secondaries and we've treated those along with chemotherapeutic um, treatment. And we've gotten a really good result. We've got stasis. Um, but the patient was um, describing to me that when they're initially diagnosed, they're uncertain about their life, about their longevity. And then they have their treatment and then it's like, oh, great, survive that. Then they have the recurrence. So there's the acute worry again. But then they get over that recurrence and now there's this, you know, anxiety with regards to how long have I got left? Do you find that a big issue and how do you cope with that? How do you treat that? Um, I think, um, yeah, I think, I think it's just, um, yeah, I think it's talking to the patients. I think it's knowing when to refer, so when do they need referral on to psychology or bits and pieces. But yeah. Um, they, yeah, they definitely do get to a place at the end there where they just, it's like they, they go through the turmoil of, uh, it's almost borderline between acceptance and borderline defeated by it, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, it's focusing on that, even if they feel defeated, defeated, I guess, by the disease, that the focus should be quality of life, not quantity of life. So that by helping support them, that you're still going to be providing them with such a better, better quality of life than... Um, what they'll have um, if they do nothing at all. Um, I, I gotta, I gotta say, I, I, I just remembered the um, one of the beauties about Lise Alschler, who's uh, another expert and treats a lot of cancer patients. Um, and what she said is this: offering the patient um, realistic hope. Um, and she was just she puts things so eloquently this lady uh, I'd implore the listeners to uh, get a hold of the uh, the recordings of the 2014 Biocircle Symposium if they can and, and listen to Lisa's talks so Sarah let's just talk about a few of the supplements that you might use in your practice and, and turmeric really stands out as a sort of hero in, in any infl inflammatory driven disease so what are your experiences with using this spice and what have you used throughout the years of your practice? Because it's changed quite a bit recently. It, yeah, it certainly has. Um, turmeric is definitely um, a stayer for cancer treatment because it, it does, it has so many um, properties as far as its anti-inflammatory properties, but it's also angiogenic properties. Um, certainly, um, obviously, the new biocidicals, um, form of curcumin, you know, as everyone knows, is the most bioavailable form. Um, but it certainly progressed from, I guess, you know, now Jeezy, I guess, was the original turmeric that came out. And then we've certainly seen it evolve um, dramatically over the last 12 months. So I generally use either liquid turmeric myself mm -hmm. or I'll use the biocidicals turmeric. Mm -hmm. um, I The interesting stuff with the research, I don't, I don't know if you've seen a, um, Kerry Bone talking about turmeric recently, but he was also saying that, there's been some trials where they've actually removed the curcumin out of turmeric 
and it still seems to have an a, um, anti-inflammatory effect, um, but they're not too sure how yet. So there's still a lot more investigation occurring into turmeric as a herb because it it still has this angiogenic, uh, sorry, anti-inflammatory property even without the curcumin in it. Um, but no, I think I think turmeric's a beautiful herb, but I think you know you, you do need to be using decent doses. So I tend to use probably between um, two thousand to three thousand milligrams a day. Mm-hmm. So with cancer patients, so you do have to find products that can supply that, and there's only really a few products on the market that you can use those sort of levels of dosage without costing a fortune for the yeah. patient. Yeah, it's a big issue, isn't it? The cost. Definitely, definitely. There's you know. I, I, you know, and I think that's another one. Patients, you know, I've certainly seen patients come to me from other practitioners, and they're they're spending a fortune either because practitioners are supplied at all, because they've just gone off on their own and they're trying to self medicate, um, and they they can spend you know spend a fortune. And I think that's another consideration you have to make is that yes, you want to spend your money and you want to do what you can to survive, but you also have to be realistic if you know if, if they're a, a mum or a dad and they've got kids or whatever, but you're also that financial burden is going to be passed on to the um, the rest of the family if they if they do or don't pass away. Mm. And so, any caveats or limitations that you've seen with with turmeric or curcumin extract? Um, probably with turmeric, the probably the main thing is if you're using high doses, it it, it could be considered a blood thinner, I mm. guess, to mm. a degree. So it's certainly a factor you need to consider if any of your patients are then going to be if they're going to have surgery or if um, they have been put on any blood thinners or clexane due to blood clotting issues that can occur with liver and pancreatic patients. So um, definitely the blood thinning issues would be would be probably one of the major ones um, that I think pr- practitioners need to consider. And probably just with the liquids and things, patients with GERD, because um, it yep. certainly there's some patients that tumour can certainly um, cause more reflux in GERD patients. Um, oh, okay. if, if they've got a significant ulcer. Yep. That was the original limitation with, uh, you know, the non-bioavailable turmeric was the, the gastrointestinal side effects with high dose. Yep. So, Sarah, what about using supplements alongside chemo? Because there is some data. It's early days yet. There, yeah, there is. Uh, definitely th- there's more evidence supporting, um, obviously, that the safety as far as supporting the immune system goes with cancer treatment. But mm-hmm. in saying that you do have to be careful of some cancers because some cancers um, like your leukemias, you certainly need to be careful of what you're doing with their immune system for those patients. Mm-hmm. Um, but for most of the other, I guess, non-blood-borne um, cancers, um, definitely the immune system, um, there's certainly evidence to support that. The liver is something that originally um, naturopaths tended to steer away from because of the concern over um, whether or not we were flushing the drugs through the liver too quickly. So that's a consideration in that you definitely need to help support the liver, but you can't support it too much because if you're using too high doses of herbs that flush the um, the liver enzymes through, um, enzyme pathways that you're then going to flush the drugs through, through at a faster rate, which will decrease its efficiency, which would be a concern for oncologists. So I think definitely supplements that support the liver. There's certainly been some research with St. Mary's Sissel as far as some safety data on that patients that use it certainly have better survival rates um, post-treatment that, yep. use, that use it due to the protective properties of, say, Mary Sissel. Mm-hmm. Um, as is, there's more data it's surfacing on ginkgo, for example, being um, um, DNA protective with radiation. But again, you have to be careful with ginkgo being a blood thinner mm-hmm. so as, to, as to whether you use it and in what conditions. So the caveats would be regarding uh, CYP enzymes versus yes. P glycoprotein pump inhibitors, that inhibition, that sort of correct. issue, yeah? Yeah, correct. A lot of the drugs, the chemotherapy drugs, and even a lot of the oral medications move through that um, CYP um, enzymes, if, the, through the different enzymes. So a consideration has to be um, when using herbs like, say, Mary Sissel, that we know pushes those, that we're careful with the dosages that we're using so that we're not flushing the drugs through too quickly or inhibiting their function. And uh, so what sort of supplements do you use in, uh, you know, clinically in, uh, during chemotherapy? So during chemotherapy, I look at using um, 
definitely probiotics. So probiotics to help support the gut function due to the um, intestinal damage that occurs with the chemotherapy. Mm-hmm. Um, and it certainly helps with mouth ulcers um, and those sort of conditions. Obviously, the probiotics are good for thrush as well, which is um, often a side effect of treatment, which um, which a lot of them struggle with. Um, making sure that they're using a decent, like a, a decent multivitamin, decent something that's got a decent amount of vitamin Bs in it, um, because I've certainly found that patients become depleted over time with treatment as far as nutrition goes. But also um, watching their iron status, whether or not they need iron or not, because of the um, bone marrow being affected from the chemotherapy, a lot of them the hemoglobin starts to drop, so trying to support that iron as well during treatment. So, you know, looking at those sort of supplements. And then, of course, of course, looking at your angiogenic, what you could be doing on an angiogenic front with your turmeric or um, St. Mary's thistle, avoiding antioxidants um, at, that, at that point during chemotherapy. But, um, you know, immune system, echinacea, cat's claw, um, astragalus are really great herbs for immune function. Um, St. Mary's thistle is a good safe one for liver, again, depending on dosages and when and where you use it. All of those sort of things, um, you know, there's certainly pros and cons for glutamine depending on when you're using it um, for treatment. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess looking at, you, you try to look at the whole picture, but again, Andrew, I guess it depends because the treatment protocols are so different and the side effects of the different chemotherapy drugs are so vast that yeah. it's yeah. hard to sort of just come up with a handful. Have you ever used the uh, medicinal fungi and mushrooms in your treatment pro- um, regimes? Definitely, definitely. So... Um, the the mushrooms, there's obviously a ton of research to support uh, mushroom extract. So, yeah, a huge fan of mushroom extract. Um, again, there tends to be some cancers that I'd use it more so for than others. Mm-hmm. Um, I must admit with the mushroom, I'll use a, a significant dose during chemotherapy, but it's certainly something that I follow with post-chemotherapy. Mm. So really to get that immune system back up and running. Um, and you certainly, there's a lot of research to support the stimulation of um, natural killer cells um, through using the mushroom extracts. And what about the controversy with the antioxidants? Uh, you know, Keith Block did a, a review and just said there was basically no evidence to show that it had a deleterious effect on chemo and radiotherapy. Um, and yet many oncologists shy away from it. They're very hesitant because they think it's going to thwart the pro-oxidant effect of the radio and the chemotherapy. What's your um, view on this? Um, I agree. I, and the vitamin C would fit into the same category, um, would be the same issue that oncologists seem to target. They really don't like the CoQ10. They don't like um, vitamin C, any of those high-dose antioxidants. Mm-hmm. Um, when you look at the research, I've certainly found as much research to show that patients that use Q10 and use vitamin C have a better prognosis and a better survival rate as the amount of research that I've showed that it's that it's a... Um, that it is an issue and that it affects chemotherapy. Mm. So to be honest, Andrew, I guess the jury's still out in that as soon as we see research to support it, there's another one disproving it. Yeah. So I must admit in my practice, I tend to steer away from it more so out of a, not because I think it would genuinely interfere with treatment, but more to be respectful of um, what the oncologists um, do or, or do or don't want done yeah. with their patients. I guess your practical point there about improving the patient's immune status and their general nutrition so that they can handle the onslaught of chemotherapy and radiotherapy uh, would give you some grace period, if you like, until after the chemotherapy and radiotherapy is finished, then you can institute antioxidant approach. Is that how you work? Yes, absolutely. So I definitely, as soon as that chemotherapy is finished, that's when you really start mopping up and getting as much... um, as much as you can in there just to help up any of that pre-radical damage that would have obviously would have occurred from treatment. So then, yeah, once it's all finished, then you'd be hitting hard with the antioxidants. But I think in the interim, um, I guess you've always got to weigh up the risks versus benefits of what you're doing. Mm. So because the jury's still out and because patients are already trying to to manage so many other um, issues going on, that they're already on so many supplements anyway, um, that they would be getting some antioxidant function through other things that you are sort of that you are sort of using anyway. Yeah, in a broader sense. And uh, the the point that you make about you know mopping up the damage afterwards, when do you think it's appropriate to detox people? 
Well, I think I think as soon as someone's finished treatment, you could certainly be getting in there and working on the liver in bits and pieces. Um, I don't detox any of my patients heavily for, I'd say, a good six weeks after treatment, mm-hmm. um, in some cases three months. Mm-hmm. So generally when people are finished treatment, they're so sick that they're not really in a condition for you to be putting them on a strict diet or um, doing anything significant with them. And they're, they're so toxic that if you push them too hard, you just you make them very sick. Mm. So usually as soon as they're finished treatment, I certainly support the liver in a, in a much with ho- much higher doses um, for probably the six weeks, but not enough to cause a um, you know any any type of discomfort for the patient. But then after six months to three months, that's when I would after between sorry six weeks to three months, I would then look at um, in, you know putting them on some type of stricter diet to really detox the liver and the kidneys, mm. um, and not to forget the kidneys because I think we all focus on liver, but the yes. kidneys really get a run with the chemotherapy as well, mm. and really rebuilding that gut function because the chemotherapy just strips the gut lining um, because it is such a it's a it's a tissue that grows so quickly that it is a tissue that's targeted by the chemotherapy. So really getting that gut function and that gut flora back mm. um, would be paramount straight after chemotherapy. But detox probably six to three months. Um, sorry, six weeks to three months. Um, but then I would probably be doing a detox every six months for a period of time. I'd probably even over two years just to keep flushing the drugs out because they do store in the system. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think uh, practitioners should be mindful that, you know, around about the 10 to 15% of detox is done in your gut, by your gut. Uh, so it's not just yep. the liver that we need to concentrate on. Yeah. So uh, we mentioned earlier, Sarah, your use with um, the various turmerics on the market. And I know that you've been recently exposed to the biocidicals theracurmin. Have you had a chance to use it in kids yet? Not yet with children. Children are a funny thing, particularly, I guess, if we're focusing on cancer. Mm. Um, the research shows that parents, uh, the paediatric oncology is probably the one group that is most likely to look at using natural therapies, yet as an industry with paediatric oncologists, they're, they're probably the strictest as far as really being... Um, you, t- you tend to get a lot more opposition from oncologists that treat children versus adults. So yeah. as much as parents certainly seek natural therapies, um, often the parents are too scared to um, go against what the oncologists say, in particular with children. Now, Sarah, you also have an interest in using pawpaw leaves, don't you? What results do you see and where do you use it? Um, with the pawpaw... Um, oddly enough, I was doing some research and there's certainly a lot of information to support the use of pawpaw um, leaves, which I guess is why, you know, I guess the old boiling the pawpaw leaves and drinking it has been around for a long time as far as an alternate cancer approach has been. Um, for some reason, I, the, I, and I and I can't really explain why, Andrew, but when I'm treating lung cancer patients in particular, um, time and time again, I've noticed that when using pawpaw for those patients, that they have often reported um, that when they're on the pawpaw, they've noticed their breathing's better, um, not coughing as much, um, and there seems to be that when you're using it with those patients that they seem to have a better prognosis than mm. those that don't. But to be honest, I don't really understand the, the hows or the whys. No, I think it's early days. But in a pra- but it, yeah, but in a practical setting, I certainly think it's something that's worth considering when treating lung cancer patients. Mm. And what about the use of, you know, uh, bromelains and other inhibitors of the um, the matrix metalloproteinases or the MMPs? Bromelains has got quite a little bit, quite a bit of research on it, um, but there's also quercetin and proteolytic enzymes. Do you use those in your practice at all? Yeah, I do, and they they, they certainly seem to be. I guess quercetin's been around a lot longer, mm-hmm. so we've probably got a lot more data on quercetin and how it it works with the MMPs. Um, it seems to be the quercetin I probably use more so when there's more metastatic involvement because it's sort of, um, there's a bit more research about its angiogenic, uh, sorry, not about the apoptosis effects as well as angiogenic, where the bromelain seems to be more, um, is, is definitely, the bromelain seems to be gaining momentum as far as research goes. So it's probably, we're getting a lot more really significant data on how when working with those enzymes, how you can inhibit inhibit cancer growth. Mm. Um, 
So I probably would use quercetin more when there's metastatic involvement, but bromelains more so um, when there's just a primary. Mm-hmm. But always keeping an eye on the enzymes and, um, and you know, definitely we know from patients that when, um, you know, that those enzymes, they, are, they do have an anti-inflammatory component um, and there's so many other benefits, not just on the cancer front. Mm. So just to round this off for the listeners, let's sort of take an, a, a hypothetical cancer patient that would come into your practice. Can you lead the listeners through what you do at various stages through their visit to you and, and their um, therapy? Yeah, so basically when I'm seeing a patient, the first thing I want, basically the first thing we go through is really understanding what the disease is, so really having a good understanding of what the disease is, what investigations have they done, um, what what are the specific drugs, so knowing what specific chemotherapy they're going to use, how long is the treatment protocol going to be going for, if they're going to have radiation, how many sessions are we going for, um, in what order are things being done? So mm. sometimes patients will have chemo, surgery, radiation. Sometimes they'll have surgery, chemo, then radiation. So you sort of need to know the format of yep. what what's going to happen, and that varies from cancer. And, and you know, and even um, the same disease can be managed differently from oncologist to oncologist as far as how they prefer to have their protocol run. So basically, have a really good understanding of what the patient is taking and what the side effects of those drugs are. So then I sort of look at their protocol. In my head, I'll think, well, these are the side effects that we're going to be looking for. So which organs need to be supported? What are the potential problems that the patient's going to have? Um, So definitely I I then start to pick up the systems, I guess, as far as which systems are going to be affected. Um, But I don't often treat side effects off the bat. Um, so often what I'll do is let them have a round first and see what happens because yeah. sometimes people cruise through chemotherapy and they don't have any side effects. Yep. So I'm not necessarily going to jump onto mouth ulcers or nausea straight away because they might they might find that they travel through and then they're taking a supplement for no reason. Yep. So often we'll do a round of chemotherapy, see how they're running and then manage the side effects from there because usually whatever whatever side effects a patient suffers with from the first round of chemotherapy, as long as the medications don't change, they generally reappear in the same format every time. So you don't usually get a kinder surprise three rounds in. It's usually whatever they get on the first round, you'll usually see on every round after that. So then you can sort of then pick up, do they need, you know, nausea support or mouth ulcers or thrush or those sort of things. So with your dialogues with the oncologists that you work with and around in the community, how do you initiate conversations? How do you approach um, dialogue with them? Um, oh, I, I think that's really difficult, Andrew, because I think they are really hard to touch base and connect with because mm-hmm. um, they're so busy. Um, I think I've just been in a very fortunate position in that I've come from that industry working as an nurse, so I've, I've had a relationship with them to begin with. Mm-hmm. But I think, um, I think in general it would be a real struggle for people to connect and make communication with oncologists. So I really think that you need to be, I guess, it's relying on that communication through the patient back and forth to um, for that communication to occur because I don't think there'd be that many oncologists that have the time to spend or, you know, that want to make that time to spend with naturopaths to discuss yeah. um, treatment protocols. Yeah. What, what about um, something like a, a letter that the patient might take to the oncologist saying, look, you know, your patient has approached me for support. I just want you to know that I'll be doing this with evidence and, at, at, you know, I won't be upsetting your chemotherapy, da, da, da. Do you ever do that with your patients? Um, certainly with some patients I do, depending on the oncologist. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's a really good idea and I think it's really important that naturopaths promote transparency with treatment. So... It's really important that patients do know what's in their herbs and what they're taking so that when they do see the oncologist that they can list what they're taking. Um, if they have any... And if the oncologist has any issue, usually you can take that list of medications down to the pharmacy, the hospital pharmacy, and they can cross-check it against all the herbs that you're taking um, and then that will show up whether there's any issues or not for the oncologist to be concerned about. Um, but you, naturopaths certainly need to be encouraging transparency um, as far as what they are on because I think a lot of people 
don't tell their oncologist and then they end up in trouble because yeah. they're of that fear of the oncologist rejecting or um, rejecting their belief system, I guess. Mm. Um, so I think I think definitely a letter um, listing exactly what you're giving the patient and then if the oncologist has any issues that they can then contact you and that you'd be happy to provide any research or information to help support why you're sort of doing a particular thing. Mm. Well done. Sarah, I, I think you've given the listeners today not just um, some biochemical sort of information, if you like, about what you're using and why you use them, but also, most importantly, these practical tips that um, practitioners who are interested in treating or looking after cancer patients can take into their practice and use on a day-to-day basis. So I really thank you for um, giving us your expertise today. That's great. You're welcome. And I, and I hope that um, I guess one thing with cancer is that there's certainly a lot of naturopaths that are nervous of treating cancer patients when as long as you're working within your scope of practice, you'll be fine. Mm. Um, but I think also encouraging naturopaths to share information openly and transparently, which will help all of us and will help the patients um, receive better treatment out- outcomes, I guess. Mm. Here, here. Well done. Sarah Franklin, thank you very much for joining me today on the line. You're welcome. Thanks, Andrew. This is FX Radio, and I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook.